All right, we are live. Hello, this was week six of a 26 week challenge that I basically attempted here. If you don't know me, my name is Mark. I'm known on YouTube as True Poker Dealer, and I have been helping teach people to be poker dealers for about 10 years through YouTube. I've helped thousands of people learn to be poker dealers, and I've been in the industry since back in 2007. Uh, table games, poker, you name it, supervisor, dealer, shift manager, all the good stuff. And here we are right now, and it's time for me to recap week six of my challenge where I made a pretty big adjustment. Um, so I realized that five days a week, 55 hours a week was a lot, but that doesn't mean I am not challenging myself still. So I asked because, let me let me give a little recap here, okay? Weeks one through three, I made it to 50 hours with no issue. Um, I actually did 50 like seven the first week, 55 the second week. It was five 11 hour shifts. I did a little bit more the first week. The second week I did four days just because they scheduled me for that. And I was like, you know what? Let me give it a shot. See if I can hit 50 hours. I actually did 55 hours on four days working 13 and 14 hour days sometimes. And I realized that this is something that I can do. I can do 13 to 14 hours. I know what it feels like. I can do it. I can make it through it. I will say sleep and eating correctly are the number two factors for me personally that allow me to be able to work a 13 or 14 hour day as a poker dealer. Also, I should give a shout out to Texas Card House. They make it so that you can actually do that. A lot of poker rooms don't even put that on the table as an option. What I did this past week was I told myself, I want to do 40 hours in three days. So I had on the schedule, I asked for three days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of this past week at Texas Card House. And my last table, my very last table of the entire 40 hours is a really cool little like side story about what happened. But I'll tell you guys about that in a bit. Um, but the the thing that I ended up doing is I started at 8 a.m. on Wednesday. I worked until 10 p.m. That's 14 hours, uh, almost 10 p.m. They actually forced me out 30 minutes before I asked, which is totally fine. I'm not complaining in any way. A force out is a common thing in the industry where they're just like, everybody wants to stay or we're just gonna send you home because you started so long ago. And But I made it 40 hours in three days this week and it didn't feel that bad. It didn't feel that intense and there is some story that goes with it. You know, my thumb healed up, fortunately. Uh, that was a real issue the previous couple of weeks. Um, and I feel really good about being able to make it 40 hours in, in just three days of working. And then I have four days to myself, which as it turns out actually isn't true because I, I forgot to communicate that I wanted three days from here on out and they gave me four days this coming week. So we're gonna see what happens. I don't know if I'm gonna go for 50 hours or 44 hours, we'll see what I do, but pretty excited about this now. As always, questions, please bring them in. Comments, bring them in. Uh, the more comments and questions that show up in the chat, the more interesting stuff I get to talk about, but if you're a poker dealer who is doing something like working the circuit or the series or any of those things where you just deal lots and lots of hours in, in a given day, you can certainly relate to what I'm talking about where you go in and if you do not sleep enough, you are absolutely gonna pass out on that table. It takes a lot to be able to deal and deal and deal, especially when you're doing four table strings, sometimes more than that. Um, and for those that don't know, a string is a series of tables that you deal one after another. 30 minutes is the way that I usually see it. Occasionally you see 40 minutes per table, occasionally you see 20 minutes, occasionally you see something else. But these, these four table strings are really good for the experiment that I'm running right now. And I said this in the beginning, I've never gone six months dealing 40 hours a week in my career. Uh, it's a very eye-opening thing to experience that. Most, like I've supervised, you know, 50 hours a week for consecutive weeks for long periods of time. I've supervised a lot. Dealing, I haven't been in the box like this where it's been like truly full time. You know, there's an exception to that, I suppose, when I was a table games dealer in the beginning, I did uh, deal a lot of that, but it's a different thing, it's not poker. All right, so what are some of my experiences? One thing that I noticed was as I'm dealing, the way that I've been sitting and I had to make this adjustment, 
I get sore back here from sort of leaning over as I'm reaching a lot. And that is something that I had to make an adjustment with every single table now. If you see me deal, you'll see me sitting up straight um, and, and just checking my posture. It's an important thing for me to do because the more time that I spend hunched over, the more that's going to stick. It's one of the reasons that I say regularly that dealing poker is an amazing 30 hour a week job. You know, my perspective on it is you make really good money, you don't have to put in the full-time hours, and you can come out of it with a bunch of time in your life, being able to chase passive income, um, build things up in your life that really made a different, really make a difference for your long term. And if you ever do need money or you want to save up for something, you go get it in a lot of poker rooms. Some poker rooms it's harder to adjust your schedule, but you can pick up shifts nowadays with some good software that's out there. CNF says. I wish I could get more hours. Dealers are part-time only at my casino. Yeah, it's interesting. I literally just commented on that before I read it. Texas Card House, Dallas. I don't. I don't. I've never really interacted with any of the other Texas Card Houses, so I can't speak for them. But Texas Card House, Dallas. You know, run by a very, very, very good GM, where he cares about the the feelings that the people have that work there a lot. Um, you can't make everybody happy, but he does a damn good job of it. One of the things that he teaches the supervisors, which is uncommon in the industry, okay? I want to be very clear about this. This is uncommon in the industry. He teaches the supervisors a very specific type of accommodation where the supervisors will accommodate people. If you can find win-wins, a lot of the times they're going to find it. Is it their policy to do all that? I'm really not sure. Um, I feel very happy to see this culture at Texas Card House Dallas where if a person wants to stay, they can stay. If they want to pick up a shift, they can pick up a shift. They use software. It's called Deputy. Um, let me see if I can actually show you guys Deputy for a second here. I don't have the ability to bring this up on the screen, but let me see. Yeah, I got, I got to do this in a way where you can't really see. It's, it's got everybody's name in here, so I'm not going to be able to show you guys. But um, the, the Deputy app is something that uh, it's not perfect, but it does a really good job of allowing a smooth uh, experience for dealers, being able to pick up shifts and, and swap them and all this stuff. And one of the cool things about being a poker dealer from a business perspective is if, if you're not making that much money as a base pay, which most poker dealers aren't, you don't really have to worry about uh, a, a dealer picking up lots of hours in most cases because if they pick up lots of hours, you're not paying them that much in overtime. So, you know, Texas Card House doesn't really seem to care about that. I think that's a beautiful thing. And, I mean, I'm, I'm all for that. Uh, <laughs> love your live stream. Thanks for the info. So, I actually met, uh, this is, this is Farron, I think. Let me see, Farin. I'm so sorry, I forget if it's Farin or Farin, but thank you so much for commenting. I had the pleasure of meeting you during this week uh, and you sort of came up to me and I get this from time to time and I really appreciate these types of interactions. You came up to me, you said I had an impact on your life and you tossed me a few bucks and you know, you you were playing poker at the time, and um, I, I'm super appreciative of that. So thank you for the acknowledgement and all that stuff. The table was sort of like, what was all that all about? And um, a couple people knew that I was true poker dealer at the table that I'm dealing. And yeah, I came and I chatted with you after and, and got to know you a bit. And uh, that's what I'll do, by the way. If you come and say hi, I'm going to do my best to come find you when I have a little bit of time. And I really love getting to know the stories of everybody. Um, I am just out here sort of doing me and like teaching people is something that I'm doing, but I'm not there when you're learning from me. So I don't really know who's learning, how to deal poker, how it's impacting you until I hear the stories later. And one thing I've absolutely been blown away by the number of stories that I've heard um, people come up to me, tell me all these different things about how I've impacted them. And I'm just super appreciative every single time I hear another story because it's really motivating, right? Like I'm out here doing this for a very long time. I was making like no money as true poker dealer. I had people that would sort of like, that were friendly with me that would sort of poke fun at me because I'm just giving away the information. But 
I sort of believe in helping and I believe in creating resources that are valuable. And I did turn this into a business where now you can learn on my channel how to deal poker start to finish. But for a long time, it was just all free content. And, you know, I've had a lot of people that come up to me with a lot of appreciation and, and you were one of them. And I, I'm, I'm really, I love, I love those interactions. I will admit I'm pretty awkward when you meet me in person because when I'm dealing, I'm distracted. It's taking a lot of my mental energy. I'm, I'm a, a terrible multitasker and an excellent multitasker. What do I mean by that? When I am very familiar with the things that I'm doing, I can do a lot of them really easily at the same time. But when it comes to communication and talking to somebody, that takes like all of my brain just the way that I am because I am sort of an empath and, and I'm like trying to understand the person on a deep level very quickly. And so I'm terrible at conversations, but I still want them. Like I, I always want to talk to people and I always want to meet people. And uh, when I've got other stuff going on, I'm going to do my best. But yeah, thank you for, for that. Thank you for coming to say hi. Thank you for the, the comment. And I should, I should mention here, so uh, Farron said that he just dealt his very first tournament in a poker room yesterday, and um, that's a really cool story, and like the way that you got into it, where, and this, these types of stories happen, right? Somebody will learn some of the basics from me, and then it'll give them an opportunity where they can like learn and grow with some poker room, and this is what, what your story was and it was amazing and this is sort of a side thing that you're doing for fun which I always say dealing poker is an amazing thing to do on the side of anything because you can get all your bills paid or if you've got your bills paid from what you're doing in your life you can have extra spending money and some fun. Um, the more that you love poker the more relaxing dealing poker is by the way. So definitely appreciate that and appreciate the shout out and uh, appreciate all the likes. I, I see you guys liking the video. Thank you for that too, making me happy here. So let's see, what else What else did I have this week? Um, I had, let me see. So I did do the 40 days in, or 40 hours in three days, all right? That was my challenge for myself this week. I, again, I taught myself I can do 14 and 13 hour days dealing, no problem. Um, and I put myself to the test to get myself full-time hours, 40 hours in three days. Me as an entrepreneur, me as true poker dealer, me as somebody who has this business on the side and has other projects that I'm working on, um, that's a valuable thing for me to be able to have full-time hours in three days, dealing poker, get all the money that comes with that, and then also have four days to myself, which I'm not gonna lie, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday were when I did the 40 hours, Uh oh well that was weird it said no data for a second but here we are we're still good I'm not gonna lie Wednesday Thursday Friday was when I did the full-time hours and um, Saturday I just had to be like a potato I, I couldn't do anything I mean it was really hard but let me tell you guys something cool that happened to end my my very last table on Friday of the 40 hours so because I happen to be at Texas Card House Dallas, there are vloggers that come through there from time to time. And I was in a, I was fortunate enough to, as my very last table, I was dealing to Next Gen Poker, um, two of the guys from Next Gen Poker who are, they, they've really worked their way up there. I, I, I am, I don't watch a ton of their content because I don't watch a ton of content in general nowadays, but I am huge fans of the, the young guys from Next Gen Poker who are poker vloggers, they're on YouTube, and I sat down at a table with two of them dealing. I was dealing my very last table, two of them were playing, and they were doing a live stream actually. Uh, and I, I checked out the live stream after to make sure that the camera angles were good and everything, just you know to protect the house a little bit. but. Um, I was very impressed with the way that they approach it. Um, it's funny, I, I might have sort of tried to talk them into uh, dropping out of college. Um, they've only got one semester left and they're banging on full cylinders, but they're, they're sucking up their time doing something else. Everyone's got their own opinions about that type of thing, but um, I, you know, it was really cool dealing to them at the end and being a part of that live stream and uh, you know big shout out uh, Frankie is somebody that I've talked to a few times as he's come in the room and these guys are they're they're solid they're content creators they're 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 got a, they got a lot of energy the very first time I ever met them was when I was dealing actually to Brad Owen um, 
when when Brad and Andrew come to town, uh, which is occasionally, you know, Andrew Andrew Nimi, Brad Owen, Andrew Nimi come to town. They do a meetup game. A lot of the vloggers show up too because they want the extra publicity, the extra like buzz, and it works really well. And I happen to deal to to two of them. It's the very first time I met them. I dealt to two of them and Brad at the same time. And they just brought all this energy to the table. It was really interesting. And so I do want to give a shout out to Next Gen Poker. These guys are really likable, especially if you're younger, um, because they've got that enthusiasm for playing poker that is a beautiful enthusiasm, that it's it's about learning, growing. It's about um, sort of making awesome stuff happen. And it's 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 pretty cool. Nick Novak says, if you work less than 40 hours, you should shave off your eyebrows. That would be motivation to get your hours in. Well, I appreciate the uh, the humor challenge side of it. I know that that would get a lot more views. Um, and I'm definitely open to coming up with some kind of a challenge. Uh, by the way, Nick is my number one troll. Um, and I say that in a fun way. I used to work with him. But, all right, let's, let's see for a second. So do I want to put myself out there and put some kind of an interesting challenge up there? to motivate myself to hit my hours. Here's, here's the problem with it. I'm not gonna fail if I do that. And the thing that, that people are gonna wanna do is root against me. Um, but what would, come up with something else. What's something that would actually work where, uh, cut a mullet, I sort of already have that. Like, I mean, it's not really a mullet, but I can sort of, I could sort of do that already almost. I guess not, it's like on the outsides too, but. Um, probably common in Texas. <laughs> um, I mean, these are, so, all right, a challenge in order to hit the hours. It's just, I, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest about this. I don't think of it as that hard. Yeah, you said short in the front. So, you know, I've done this and I've got this hair all over the place. I still don't know what to do with hair. I, I grew this last year during COVID for the first time and I'm still learning how to do it. Um, I could turn it into a challenge. Let me put it this way. So at some point soon, I'm probably going to be teaming up with other people in poker to create content. And then I will probably be creating more regular content, not just live streams that are super long videos where people really have to want to watch them, right? So if that does happen, I could see myself putting out challenges like that. And I really appreciate that idea. Challenges are great. They're a lot of fun. And I'm totally down with something like that. Uh, if 40 hours is too easy, go for 55. So, so here's the problem with that. I, like I've, I've done 55 hours now. 55 hours is, it's not hard to do if I just put the time in unless I'm going to see my kids and I don't want to start choosing against my kids. Uh, well, let, me, let me think about it. I'm going to come up with something there. I like that. Or you come up with something. Uh, Reprise says, I'm in my second week of poker dealing school with no casino experience. Just found your channel. Thank you for the info. Appreciate that. And you're welcome. And I'm curious, uh, I mean, can you give your dealer school a shout out? I like, I always like hearing about all that stuff. Um, what dealer schools are around the country, what they're teaching, what it's like in the dealer schools. It's a good place for dealer schools to come and, and shout themselves out. By the way, I do teach a course on how to deal poker, but I totally understand that sitting in front of a computer and watching video after video after video is not everybody's way to learn. Um, a lot of people want to be social. A lot of people want to learn in person. Um, now, if you can learn with my course, which a lot of people can, that's great. But the best way to learn how to be a poker dealer is to combine my course and what's uh, and going to an actual school. One thing I will caution you on if you're in dealer school, a lot of the time, dealer schools are teaching you to the best of their ability what they have learned is the correct way to deal poker. The thing that I've learned as true poker dealer over the years by having conversations with people that work in rooms around the country and the world is that there are many different ways that are considered correct. So I, I would caution you when you're like one of the reasons it's so good to get my course on top of dealing school is because I'm going to give you that perspective. When I teach how to do stuff, I'm doing it from multiple perspectives almost all the time and talking about, you know, this region is like this, this region is like this, this region is like this. And, and it is valuable to get that perspective for sure. Uh, let's see. McLevin Hawaii says, go, go positive motivation. Then if you beat the challenge and go treat yourself on a trip abroad and try dealing in Monaco or Macau or something insane, 
Uh, I like that. I like stuff like that. Positive motivation. Well, but to, to Nick's point here, it's much more interesting if I do something embarrassing publicly, right? Um, so his, his spin on this is sort of like, <laughs> he said on it or a different challenge, milk crates, dry scooping. I would have to look up what that means, man. Oh gosh. All right. Let me look up milk crates, dry scooping. I do not know what this means. The milk crate challenge went viral, but TikTok says avoid. <laughs> what are you talking about? Viral fame, but you shouldn't actually take it for a whirl. I just don't know even what to, to say here. Oh, they're trying to like walk over it or something. Nick, just tell me what they're doing in these challenges. I don't understand what they're doing in the challenges. <laughs> and I like, I can't watch a video while I'm doing this. Um, let's see. But by the way, McLevin, I like the positive motivation side of it. I mean, maybe there is something that I could do that would be motivating and everyone would root for me. Like, uh, if I make it, then next year I play the World Series main event or something like that. That could be cool. Um, trip abroad dealing in Monaco stuff like that does sound good I have actually been to Monaco um, I have not been to Macau Monaco is beautiful uh, let's see and your legs get a workout reprise says uh, Pittsburgh Pennsylvania live casino is offering the classes dry, dry scooping is taking tons of pre-workout and tweaking all the kid, cool kids are doing it do I look like one of the cool kids uh, I feel like next gen poker might be more interested in doing stuff like that. Like, um, pretty, pretty funny though. I appreciate the humor side. Milk crate challenge, milk crate challenge looks easy, but ends in spinal injuries. All the cool kids are doing it. Yeah. Well, there's a warning not to do that one. So that one's not happening. Look it up on TikTok. I will do that at some point. Um, only so that I can text and laugh with you later about it. Uh, let's see. So going back to my very last table of the day, um, I, I was talking about dealing the next gen and I want to give them a lot of credit to, you know, I started to say this, I am, I'm not someone that like watches a ton of their content. I watched a little bit of it just because I, I want to be familiar with what people are doing nowadays. And I sort of sample different people. Like I'll sample Brad Owen, I'll sample Andrew Nemi, I'll sample Rampage, I'll sample uh, just watching like maybe 10 minute clips on double speed. I'll sample Next Gen Poker and a few others. Um, and what they were actually doing was a live stream. I haven't actually seen anybody do a live stream in the room. I'm not 100% sure that it's okay, but in a card room, it's a lot different than say in a casino. So I'm gonna assume that they had permission to do it, but the thing that I thought was really cool was they are constantly pushing, I mean, they're called next gen poker. They're constantly pushing toward the, the newest trend, the thing that makes the most sense. They're thinking in terms of numbers. They're out there trying with multiple people uh, because there's, I think, three of them. They're trying to bring what's what's new to the industry and what people are doing on YouTube in general in order to improve their channel. They started doing a whole bunch of YouTube shorts. They've got millions of views on some of these videos. And it's really helped, you know, they were trying to talk me into doing shorts on YouTube, which I would absolutely do if I wasn't currently doing this challenge and if I was not alone. It's actually pretty hard to be alone as this, um, you know, on YouTube being alone. It's a lot of work. You know, Brad Owen talks about how it's hours and hours and hours and hours to create one video. NextGen has a bunch of people working with them together. And that's what I'm trying to say here. So I respect the hell out of them on that level. And it was cool seeing them in person again. Um, and I, I just I give them credit for sticking with the trends and taking advantage of the algorithms and understanding what they're doing, which is really what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, BB says, I like how you focus on the ergonomics of dealing in your videos. I appreciate that. It's one thing to learn how to deal poker. It's another thing to be able to communicate the little details of what you must do 
as you're as you're dealing poker, right? There's there's just this. Well, uh, actually, let me let me transition this a little bit. Uh, so, in order to be able to be efficient at what you do, you have to understand the little details of how to do it, and you also have to understand the flow around you and what's okay and what's not okay. And I appreciate that comment because I do put a lot of energy into that. And I also put a lot of energy into paying attention to the gray area and where to succeed within it. Um, if you're ever learning to deal poker and you're not a poker player, I believe genuinely that by taking a thousand dollars whenever you can, and going to actually try to become a winning poker player for real, spending some time playing, but, but doing it from the perspective that you want to literally learn how to play poker as a winning poker player, you end up gaining experience that helps you as a poker dealer that allows you to find that little gray area to, to squeeze in um, little intricate wins for yourself to speed yourself up and all that different stuff. So I appreciate that comment. Um, BB says, Wes... Cutshaw does live streams at TCH Houston. Check him out. His content is full of action. All right, let's do it right now. Wes Cutshaw. Oh, I should be searching this on YouTube. All right. So I'm looking for Wes Cutshaw. 23,000 subs. I have never seen him before. Um, he does have, he's got 21,000 subscribers, which is great. Um, it's definitely a legitimate channel in a lot of different ways. And he does live streams. Nice. Well, that's pretty cool. I mean, poker vlogging is such a, a valuable thing for the industry. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly pushing to people that run poker rooms. I'm constantly pushing to them to be a vlogger friendly room. Uh, there is this stigma in the casino industry where Recording is not allowed. Recording is not allowed. Recording is not allowed. Why? Because in big casinos, surveillance is such a focus for the casino. And having there be footage that the casino has no control over puts them in jeopardy sometimes and creates these like panic feelings for the people that work there. And there's just a lot that sort of goes on with that. Um, it's just in the ICs, the internal controls of the casinos, not to allow recording. In card rooms, it's much easier. Right in a card room, it's it's not that big a deal. It, you know, you could even put a sign up in a regular casino and say there's recording going on, etc. But I'm constantly pushing people that run rooms to allow more and more video recording. I think it's only a benefit to them because poker vloggers are. I mean, I, I don't watch them closely enough to really really assess how good they are at poker. But the way that I look at it, if you're a poker room, you want poker vloggers in your room. Why? Because they're going to draw attention and bring in players and, and it's just, it's a, it's a win all the way around. The only possible downside is something that I saw happen with Rampage at Mohegan Sun, I think it was, where they apparently got upset. I don't know if I remember this story right, so um, I'm giving my allegedly story here. Allegedly, they got upset at Mohegan uh, because he released a video that made them look bad or something like that. But it might not even have been Mohegan. It might not even have been him. But stuff like that does happen. But all right. Gustavo says, Hey, Mark, something you can do about your neck is to deal standing up if the table is relatively high. I've seen a dealer in Holland standing up. Um, one town in Holland, the tables were high, but I was thinking most are quite low. So I actually appreciate that. Um, here's Here's what I'll say. Especially at Texas Card House Dallas, the tables are actually lower than I've ever seen. Um, standing up would, would be very, very difficult there. Also, I don't recommend standing up personally as a poker dealer. Table games, you're supposed to stand up. But as a poker dealer, standing up does come across as a bit unprofessional. And it also does risk... Um, you know, I know that you're saying if the table's high to, to avoid the problem I'm about to say. But it does risk the deck being exposed and stuff like that. Um... And, and it's, in my experience anyway, it's not really a possible solution. That said, I didn't say this earlier. I appreciate you bringing this up. I have actually been lowering my chair in order to be more upright, and it has helped at times. Some tables, I, I do that, some I don't. So like if I'm at a one to no limit game and 
uh, it's a bit of a dusty game or something like that, I might lower my chair a little bit, work on my posture and not worry as much about um, my speed and all that stuff and, and sort of focus on my body and what it needs. But if I'm at like a, a Congress table, which is what they call it out here, which is uh, big O, high low, big O eight, or um, like a PLO table, which there's a lot of them at Texas Card House Dallas, like a lot of them, a lot of them. If that's what I'm doing and that's what I'm dealing, I'm probably not going to be able to stand up ever or lower my chair ever is what I meant to say. Because there's just, it's like, uh, let me say it this way. Uh, we ran a PLO bomb pot tournament um, once a week we've been doing this now. And it's pretty cool to deal. I'm not going to lie. It sounds crazy. Pot Limit Omaha double board bomb pot tournament where every single hand is a Pot Limit Omaha double board bomb pot. All right. You deal everybody four cards. It is Pot Limit. There's an ante. Everybody's got to pay the ante. Um, and you bring the f both flops before the action even starts. So every single player's in. There's so much to do when you're dealing that type of a game that I can't even get to the point un until I've really created my habits. I can't even get to the point when I'm dealing this where I'm reading the board by the time they're like flipping their cards over. I'm just like, there's so much going on when by the time they're showing down, I'm like getting a chance to look at the board in order to try to read the hands as quickly as I can. So I actually instructed the players and one of these, one of these players teased me about it the next day. I instructed the players, when you flip your hand over, if you want it to be quicker, and I said this at the showdown, don't say chop, don't say like, um, you know, this guy wins, say what the hand is, what the hands are on the boards, it goes quicker that way. And the player the next day told me, hey, it's my favorite PLO board reading dealer. And I was like, I wonder what you're talking about. I didn't remember the guy the next day. And I actually thought he was referring to one of the videos that I put out where I teach people to read Omaha boards. And he, here he was, because I'm dealing this table for the first time. By the way, it was the final table. It was my very first time dealing the PLO bomb pot tournament, the double board bomb pot tournament. I, I started the final table. Um, he thought that I just wasn't good at reading boards because I made that comment, which I sort of had a laugh about. But uh, I mean, it's, it's one of those things where I, I will say this. A lot of dealers is a bad habit. A lot of dealers who are not as experienced dealing uh, or, or reading hands in Omaha, a lot of dealers are going to just listen to what the players say and not actually make sure that they see for themselves what the hands are. I don't do that. I always make sure that I see the hands. It just makes it quicker if they say what they are when they table them. Um, and cards do speak. So if, if a player tables their hand and this is, this is an interesting uh, truth. In poker, it's okay for me as the dealer when a player tables their hand to ask the whole table to speak up at what the hand is. It's not cheating. Once the cards are face up and properly tabled, cards speak. Therefore, every player actually has the responsibility if they notice that, that there's a winning hand, they have the responsibility to speak up. So it's one of the few times where it is actually helpful and acceptable for every single player to speak up for a tabled hand to say what it is. Um, it's a little bit of a weird dynamic, but it is true. Um, that being said, if this was like the World Series of Poker, the, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm probably not going to be asking the players to do anything like that. But this is like, it's a unique case here. BB, as a player, TCH tables are horrific. Too low for tall, medium height players. Uh, we, have a, we have a dealer who, I've, I've never seen this before, but this guy's a really nice guy. We have a dealer who also plays poker, and the guy is seven foot, one inches tall. I'm not exaggerating. And watching him deal is crazy, but I will say he's able to do it. Um, you're right that the, I don't agree that the tables are horrific. Uh, they are low. It is not ideal. Um, and tall, medium height players do have a little bit more trouble sitting there than than some other places. But that is a bit of an exaggeration. Like if you look at TCH, well, actually, I take it back. I don't know anything about Austin, Houston or um, the other location down by the border. I think it's I want to say RGB, but that's red, green, blue uh, or something like that. But uh, <laughs> I've never been down there in my defense. Um, in, in Dallas, the tables are low, but you, I mean, you can play there. There's, there's plenty of people that play there that are tall. 
Horrific, I, I, I'm going to defend Texas Card House against the word horrific. I will say this too, though. They should be higher. No question about that. Um, I also, I'm a bit of a, a purist personally. I don't, I'm, I'm going to be honest, and I don't mind being honest against Texas Card House a little bit here and there because it, it, it is a, like, I like to be authentic all the time. I personally think that the felts at Texas Card House don't have the right foam underneath them. And it's a little bit hard to get underneath the cards as a player and as a dealer. And it bugs me because it, it like, I see players struggling to fold all the time, struggling to pick up their cards and look at them all the time. And I just, I want it, I want it fixed because I worked in, you know, Seminoles, for example, where, uh, you know, the Hard Rock in, in Hollywood, Florida, where they run like 5 million guarantees and um, Coconut Creek in, in Florida, they've got the really really nice tables but one of the challenges with being in texas and this isn't their fault and i want you guys to know this you don't have access if you're in texas you do not have access to gpi you know gaming partners international or the top brands that sell casino equipment because you're not a casino and they only sell to full licensed casinos so it is challenging to compete with the gaming equipment because you sort of stuck ordering with with who you're available who's available out there to order with at least that's what i believe is going on for some of this stuff and these like poker table companies like rye park and whoever it is that they buy from they do a decent job but they don't quite get it there's like little things that they they just don't get and their customers are usually super happy with what they make without realizing what they're what they're missing um, and it's a very difficult industry to, you know, like, how are you going to get top, top quality poker tables, for example, when there's not a ton of money in buying and selling poker tables on small scales. So before like these Texas rooms were opening, there was really no motivation for companies to like make large amounts of tables in bulk with their, that are super high quality and casino standard and all this stuff. Um, BB says talking about Dallas definitely can play but too low or chairs don't go low enough so I did play poker about two weeks ago it was when I had cut my finger I decided to end my shift and I was actually sticking around the room to drive somebody home and I ended up playing poker and it was a losing session for me which I was bummed about but it happened but um I didn't have any issue with the chairs. Uh, I'll have to check it out. I'm going to go sit in a player chair and evaluate it and um, possibly talk about it on my next live stream. All right. I, speaking of that, talking about it on my next live stream, I do remember that there was a comment that I said I would talk about. There was a comment on one of my videos that I said I would talk about. Uh, oh, this one's funny. Someone on, the, on my shuffle video, uh, somebody said, why is there a shiny part in the red card in the first place? Um... That's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Hey, we got a super chat from Hit Girl. Thank you, by the way. So many players call out their hands wrong in PLO, focusing on their two pair and missing the straight, etc. Thank you for all your great content. I appreciate you, Hit Girl, every single time. Um, thank you for jumping in the chat every single time that you do. Um, appreciate you. And as always, it feels amazing to get super chats on here. Uh, getting tipped as a poker dealer is something that happens to me every single hand, just about. And getting super chats on here doesn't happen as much. I don't know why, but it feels better over here. Thank you. Appreciate you. Um, and yeah, yeah. For the record, a lot of players do call out their hands totally wrong in PLO. They do their best. So, so I don't think that Hit Girl is trying to. By the way, I love the name Hit Girl. It's just it reminds me of uh, the movie Kick Ass or something like that, which was a pretty sick movie. Um, I don't think when, when Hit Girl is saying that players call out their hands wrong in PLO, that they're trying to manipulate anybody um, into like showing down a hand and then beating them. I, I think Hit Girl is just saying like people misread their hands all the time and it's totally true. Uh, something, by the way, something absolutely wild at Texas Card House that I've never seen anything like this. I think it's common in the industry now. We have two five no limit games that are incredibly deep. Two, three, four, five, six, seven thousand deep, right? Seven thousand dollars in a two five no limit game, right? There is a, a big straddle. So Texas Card House allows two to five X the big blind in Texas Hold'em games uh, for the straddle. And 
the first hand of every single down is a $15 PLO double board bomb pot. It's really interesting watching Texas Hold'em players play incredibly deep stack PLO bomb pots and then try to read their hand. I mean, these are very big pots that the players sometimes don't know what they have. It's a great opportunity for people to, to learn PLO and, and get a feel for it at a table that's not really focused on PLO, but it's also pretty wild watching some of these hands happen. I've even seen uh, at, at a Texas Card House location, I've seen Brad Owen run into this exact same thing where he's like, I don't really know how to play this. It's a pretty big pot for a lot of money. Like, how did I get myself involved in this? But it happens all the time at Texas Card House. As a dealer, it's awesome. It's refreshing. It makes the table much more interesting and all this stuff. But um, these players read their hands wrong in PLO constantly, which is uh, sort of a fascinating dynamic. Um, Tony says, uh, Hit Girl says exactly, yeah. Tony Rare, welcome. Uh, regarding missed deals, I went through your respective lesson mentioning a duplicate card in the deck and how it needs to be a missed deal because there is something fundamentally wrong with the deck. What happens when it is only when it is only no to one player and they use the information to have an advantage known to one player? Could they play normally knowing that if they make it to showdown, they could then bring attention to it and have it be a misdeal, creating an arbitrage situation for them? They could also give themselves an advantage over players for an indefinite number of hands until it is realized by the dealer by just folding and keeping information to themselves. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Uh, at a glance, thinking about this situation, it does create an edge for a player that has that happen to them. Uh, you have to be pretty smart and aware in the moment in order to be able to properly take advantage of that. I will say this, in the entire time since 2007, the entire time that I've been in the industry, keeping in mind most of it's been a supervisor and shift manager where I'm, I'm actually I want to just, I want to mention this for a second. I have had a lot of people who play poker and deal poker. They say, I've been doing this for 20 years and therefore I know more than you about this industry. I've been exposed to more than you and all this stuff. Being a supervisor, every single table that's going, anything weird that happens, you end up finding out about. As a dealer, that's not the case. So as a supervisor, you're gaining like 10 to 20 tables worth of experience compared to a dealer that's gaining one table worth of experience at any given time, right? So I, I've been the, the, the beneficiary of a lot of supervising time and a lot of shift managing time and therefore a lot of experience for many different tables. Um, in all of that time, I don't think I've ever seen a duplicate card with, with one exception where... Um, it, it, it didn't actually, there was, there was one time where two cards from one deck made it into another deck, but they're different colored backs. And so the dealer noticed it before the hand was even, was even started or maybe like quickly in the hand as she was pitching or something. But other than that, I've never actually seen there be two of the exact same card. What I have seen is when you spread a deck, a brand new card out of the factory where the plastic is peeled off, I've seen there be uh, two of the same card in that before that was 10 years ago. So I, I will, I just want to preface this by saying I'm not worried about it. Okay. Even if a player is able to take advantage of this, I'm really not worried about it. That being said, yes, your, your, your guess is correct. If a player, like, let's say that they have a queen of diamonds and there's a queen of diamonds on the board, they can absolutely jam, keep that information to themselves. And, um, Nobody's going to know until somebody knows. But we do have game protection that does fight that uh, pretty easily. So one type of game protection is if you're using a shuffle machine, the shuffler is actually counting the stub, counting, uh, I should say, counting the deck, making sure the right number of cards are there. So in order for you to pull that off, there would have to be a card missing from the deck as well. Um, the other game protection is when you're hand shuffling, poker rooms almost always, I mean, they should always, but almost always they have a stub count procedure where you have to count down the deck at least once per table, uh, once per down is another way to say it. And therefore you're making sure the right number of cards are in the deck. And if they're not, then you take care of it. So there shouldn't be too many hands available for a player to take advantage of that information. Um, and then there's also the possibility that they both come up on the board or somebody shows it down or something like that. So technically, yes. Now, also in tournaments, every single break in a tournament, the dealer has to suit the deck, uh, both decks, actually, you know, 
and and that is another type of game protection so i mean your worst case scenario is uh somebody is sort of free rolling where the hand will get um sent back to everybody at the end of the hand also i do think that in some states the regulations i remember in a tda discussion um in 2019 or 2017 um who was it Johnny, what's his name? I don't want to mess up his last name. Johnny, uh, one of the guys on the board that was up there, who is in New Jersey, I think, was talking about how, oh no, he's in Maryland at MGM. Yes, he's in Maryland at MGM and he was talking about how the state regs talk about um, the specifics of this type of a rule and what you have to do and you have to follow the state regs for this. So I'm not even sure if substantial action or um, returning everybody's money is a result in that particular state. But there's there's so much complexity to stuff like this. But yeah, I mean, me as somebody working in the industry, yes, the thing you're saying is possible. But I got to ask you too, what's the better solution? Would it be better to allow the hand to play out? Because if you allow the hand to play out and you allow a player to win that pot, if they do have that in their hand, I feel like that that is worse for everybody if if you don't um, get rid of it. I mean, I think that, that your solution might be if somebody knowingly um, plays a hand to the end that they probably should forfeit their right to the pot. And I mean, there's a good argument to be able to do that. I haven't floored that situation in a long time. I think if that were to happen, the way that I would handle that would be to uh, discuss with the rest of the supervising staff what made sense. You know, there's this like thought as a floor supervisor, go over to the table and make a decision. That's what you need to do. You need to be a boss. You need to like all this stuff. But I mean, if you think about the role that a floor supervisor has in a room, it's sort of like an official. And think about how officials work in sports. They talk with each other when weird stuff happens. Why? Because they want to get it right. And in their case, it's get it right in terms of the rules and in terms of what happened. In pokers, in a poker room's case, they want to rule in, in what is truly fair and in the best interest of everybody a lot of the time. And so talking about a situation like that, you, you do have your set of rules, but you also have your understanding of like, did the, like who is this person on some level? And do you genuinely believe that they were taking advantage or not? Um, I can tell you this. I, I was literally sitting next to my dad in a home game one time. Okay, it's a home game. I was sitting next to my dad in a home game. He had a queen of diamonds in his hand. There was a queen of diamonds on the board. It might have been a queen of clubs, whatever. And uh, he didn't know what to do, right? So he's like, he's like just playing the hand. And then he spoke up and said, like, I don't really know what to do here. Um, this is what I have after the hand was over. I mean, am I going to follow a technical rule if a player in a casino, which just totally can happen, where someone's just like, I don't know what to do. So that's why some of this stuff does need to be handled case by case. Um, you don't really want to be wrong either if you're penalizing a player for something like this. I don't know. There's a lot to it is really what I should say. Hey, I feel like changing up my background. Um, what else we got? Poof, I'm in Texas card house. Corbin says, just hopped on. Can you talk about the financial path to becoming a dealer? Cost of entry, pay scales, opportunities, lifestyle, etc. Thanks. Uh, great question. And so your, your terminology, I'm not exactly sure what you're asking. So feel free to, um, feel free to like get get me to say the stuff that you want me to say about this as we go. Well, just real quick. Tony says, thank you for taking the time to answer that so elaborately. Sounds like there is no perfect solution makes sense as it is so rare, if not impossible from what I'm hearing from you. I mean, sort of is really the answer. Like every single deck is suited beforehand. Uh, it, it would just be pretty hard to have. And, and also just, just so you guys know, surveillance has coverage. When you fan a deck before you start using it, surveillance can see what cards are there. That's why you're supposed to do that, right? So you can go back and look, was this there in the beginning? Then you can find how it got in there. There's all these like precautions and ways to figure this stuff out. All right, so one more time. Can you talk about the financial path to becoming a dealer? Cost of entry, pay scales, opportunities, lifestyle, etc. Love this question. 
Number one, the cost of entry. You know, I, I talk about this from time to time. If you are in college trying to get a job where you can make $50,000 a year and you're in school for four years in order to get it and you're spending four years of your life at the mercy of their grading system, at the mercy of you know what jobs are willing to hire you, you could literally just spend six weeks learning to be a poker dealer, spending, if you want to do it online because you're a good online learner and you want to use my course, which does teach absolutely everything you need in order to work in any poker room in this country, um, you could spend $50 to $100 a month depending on what you need. I have both options. Um, and you can learn on your own. You might have to spend another two to $300 in order to get the proper equipment at home. But you can learn on your own and, and start to finish. You could bang it out in one to two months, especially if you take it very seriously and you work on your craft. Then in order to get an audition, you have to be practiced and you have to know where is hiring, um, which nowadays is pretty easy because during COVID, a lot of people who have been dealing for a long time stopped dealing. Poker rooms have not slowed down as it turns out. And there's a ton of hiring going on right now. But you're, I mean, you're able to spend maybe 150 at the most or $200 if you get two months of my like bonus mix game course and two, two to $300 on top of that. So for $500, you could educate yourself if you take uh, two months. So in that two months, you also are probably costing yourself, you know, whatever time you would be working in another job if you dedicate yourself like that. But you probably still have time to do both. That said, the absolute best way to do it would be to get my course and go to an actual dealer school. Uh, what is going on with the internet? All right, internet, internet cut out for a second, but it looks like it's back. I don't understand why I did that, but I don't know what to say. So uh, option two is you go to actual poker dealer school. Now they range in cost from what I've seen recently, anywhere from, uh, I mean, you can do it for free if you go to a place that has trouble hiring dealers, like in Ohio, for example. I know that there is a poker room that periodically runs a free poker dealing school that's eight weeks long, and their dealers go right into uh, their their poker room after they pass the class. Not everybody passes, just throwing that out there, it's a truth. Um, but they're pretty loyal like that. But most of the time, dealer schools are going to be anywhere from 1000 to $2,000. And... Uh, you know, the ones with the higher reputations do charge more out in California. I know that there's one that people talk highly of that that's two grand. And that is usually six to eight weeks in order to learn all the mechanics and then everything on how to deal poker. Um, and I mean, it's I, the ones that I've seen are usually something like four hours per day for that entire duration. And then if you really want to make sure that you, you do it, you put in some extra time on your own after hours in order to get practice in. Uh, it's something like 30 hours of instruction, 100, and, 100 to 140 hours of total time, including box time and all that stuff. Um, so that's the cost of entry, and that's sort of what you're looking at in order to get started. And I mean, I super recommend it to anybody. Once you are a poker dealer in a poker room, it's literally just in your back pocket. It's there for you whenever you need work. Um, I will caution everybody that's thinking about doing this. Casinos do very thorough background checks. A lot of the time the state is involved in, in giving a gaming license. So if you have a felony or anything on your record that is, uh, there, there, are, there are things that can be on your record that might prevent you from being able to get hired. That's what I'm trying to say. So I do wanna caution people to that. I also wanna let you know um, lifestyle, you are very likely looking at working holidays, um, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, stuff like that is something you do have to work in this industry. Um, you know, some poker rooms make it so that with seniority you can get those times off, but expect to work holidays, expect to work nights, expect to work um, odd hours, and sometimes you can get yourself in situations where you don't have to do that. but. That is, that is a truth when it comes to lifestyle that is important. I, I don't want to over glamorize this, right? Um, and I actually appreciate Susan, my uh, table games dealing teacher, instructor, way back in the day in 2007 when I first took a blackjack course. That's actually how I started. Um, she explained to us before we even started learning anything, 
you're gonna have to work holidays. If that's not for you, you better go because this is this is a part of this industry. Okay. That being said, a couple thousand dollars is your worst case scenario for the cost of entry, eight weeks, and um, you know then it's on you in order to pass. They give you the instruction most of the time. I give you the instruction. My course is fifty fifty to a hundred dollars a month, depending on what you're trying to learn, and. Uh, by the way, part of the reason that I make it so cheap is I want people to be able to get a taste of it to see if it's for them. Um, that's sort of the point of, of doing this. I'm also not here trying to like rake in money. I'm here trying to make it so that I have some income that comes in for me and I can help people without me having to put a ton of effort or them having to, to feel like there's not a way for them to learn, right? I want people to feel like you have a way to learn. That's why I go over everything in probably too much detail if I'm being honest. Um, but I appreciate these questions. Now, pay scales, your base pay in a poker room, I, I talk about 25 to $40 an hour. Um, realistically, 25 is about as low as you're ever going to see for a poker dealer to make in a room that has a decent number of tables. In a struggling room where they're, they're over-hiring staff in the beginning, um, and you see this sometimes in rooms that promise people the world that are just opening and then they don't end up getting the business, uh, sometimes you see like dealers getting promised that they're going to make a whole bunch of money but then there's no players and no games and a lot of dealers end up leaving and then eventually it works itself out where it is back to normal um what you see in the industry 25 plus an hour but i'm i'm the type of person who i don't like booby trapping people or getting them excited or or creating this false sense of like reality so i actually communicate on the low side uh new dealers are going to usually be making even more than 25 an hour if there's a room that has a lot of games going, but it might be 25 an hour. Your base pay is going to be anywhere from like on, on cruises. I've heard sometimes it's zero dollar base. It's all tips. Um, some rooms go a couple bucks an hour. Five bucks an hour is a common number. And then some states have laws that make it so that even casino poker dealers have to make minimum wage. And I've, I've heard of it being as high as $14 an hour. Um, in California, someone told me that recently. I forget exactly where. I know Washington State is in the high 13s, and they still get tips on top of that. Um, so I'm not supposed to talk about the specifics of how much uh, money I make, but um, I can say that I've been doing pretty well at Texas Card House. I'm super happy about it. Um, sorry, just a quick response to somebody. And... I 20, 25 to forty dollars an hour is is not exactly true. It's actually twenty five to forty plus an hour is really what I'll say as a genuine truth about how many um, you can make as a poker dealer. Um, sorry, I was looking. It said no data right now. I, I don't know what's going on with my YouTube live stream. If it's choppy, my apologies. Uh, I'm getting some weird messages here. So let's see opportunities the best way to become a poker dealer is to go through a school and be willing to relocate i mean there's no there's no no two ways about it getting yourself into a poker room is tough if you're limited to your immediate surroundings um, but throughout the industry at any given time there's usually a room that's looking to hire that would be happy to take on a project, even somebody that's not quite there yet. Like I've heard a lot of stories in Texas recently, a lot of stories of people who come to me and say, I learned from your course. I didn't go through the whole course. I worked on my mechanics that impressed them. Then they worked with me in the poker room and got me trained up for what they wanted. And then I had a job. All I had to do was just commit to them. I mean, I've heard a lot of stories like that, but I can't make it sound like it's for sure. Um, but there's a lot of opportunities like that. The traditional path is to, like around the country, let's forget about during COVID times, traditionally around the country, you have the poker rooms that are more desirable where you can make the most money are picking from people who are experienced. They, they say that they're hiring, a whole bunch of people show up to audition. The ones that are experienced are almost always the ones that are gonna get hired over the ones that are new. The new dealers that have never worked anywhere before are usually going to the less desirable poker rooms where you're still making decent money. So there's nothing to worry about there. Um, and then you get a, a six to 12 months under your belt. And then you can always go in and work in another room and pass their audition. Um, by the way, you know, I mentioned 
two thousand dollars at the most and uh like eight weeks at the most in order to learn how to be a poker dealer once you actually get a job as a poker dealer the learning continues um you you're not going to be you're going to be good enough to pass an audition at that point but you're not necessarily going to be good enough uh to like pass an audition at one of the tougher rooms for another like two to six months you got to get that work in time and 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 get all that figured out in order to do that properly so I should mention that as well. Um, now Corbin says, thanks for the awesome info, Mark. Uh, great stuff so far. I'll check out your courses. Follow-ups, do you deal private games, um, video dealer versus casino room dealer? Um, so I, I've never gotten myself into dealing private games. For years, I was worried about that affecting my license. I've never actually heard a story about somebody who's dealing private games, losing their license in a state but I'm just like a super careful, no negative risk type of personality. Um, yeah, so I'm just very careful about stuff like that myself. Realistically, am I worried about it? No. Um, private games definitely can make a lot of money. And then uh, I don't know what video dealer versus casino room dealer means exactly. Um, like I know in table games, you can be a, a video dealer in like Malta, I think, where uh, some of the table games people will like you'll deal real table games there'll be an attractive woman dealing etc I've, I've never heard of that for poker um, but I do I have dealt I'm currently dealing at Texas Card House Dallas I am friendly with the director of the room Victor uh, the GM of the property actually is what I should say he's someone that I go way back with in the industry and it's comfortable for me to work there as a result of that and um you know, I, I have nothing but positive things to say about him. Uh, I have been dealing, supervising, and shift managing in poker rooms and casinos. I started in table games as well, and I supervised table games as well back back in the, the late 2000s. But I've been doing that since 2007. I did take a five-year break to be an entrepreneur. And I, I think of myself now still as an entrepreneur as opposed to a poker dealer. But um, I have been dealing a lot lately, um, and I like that. Tony says, so so actually, uh, Corbin, let me know if there's anything else that you want me to talk about for the question that you asked. Um, I really enjoy thoroughly answering questions. And uh, if I missed anything that you want, just keep asking me stuff. It's fine. Tony says, my local room is relaxed about a lot of the subtle rules. I could almost object to an action statement by any given player violating one player per hand on every single hand if I felt the need to. How does this play into handling an audition? Is it best to enforce the rules 100% by the book during audition, even though I know it doesn't really run like that? So this is a, this is a great question. Um, yes, is the answer. In my personal opinion, I can't speak for every single auditioner, okay? Each auditioner has their pet peeves, the things that they look for and all that stuff, but I can't think of a scenario where you enforcing and properly enforcing one player per hand is ever going to be something that they don't want. What ends up happening after you get a job in a poker room, and, and by the way, it's sort of awkward uh, to hear you say that like people are violating one player per hand on every single hand. Um, for me, the way that I handle that in a relaxed room is to still say something, but not necessarily like stop everything, call the, you know, call the floor over and all that stuff in a relaxed room. But I still address it because I do think it's important for the players not to influence each other like that. You know, Texas Card House does have some of that stuff, and I am regularly speaking up on it. Sometimes it upsets players. I do have a way of handling that, though, that brings them back and, and creates camaraderie, um, and that comes with experience. But, uh, you know, it's, it's like the culture of different regions bleeds its way into a lot of this type of stuff, and the culture of um, less experienced poker regions where there's new rooms such as Virginia where I went recently there's a lot of stuff like this that happens and you sort of have to train the players but you don't but if you take it super seriously then they take it super seriously like it matters more than it does not saying one player per hand doesn't matter I actually teach an entire lesson in my course lesson number 20 about one player per hand and card speak that's the whole lesson because of how important it is what am I trying to say here in an audition enforce it uh, I, I just I can't think of a scenario where not enforcing it um, is not a good idea because you can lose a job for not enforcing it that you would have otherwise gotten, but you can't lose a job for enforcing it in my experience. I can't think of a room where the auditioner would say, oh, 
we are not hiring this person because he enforced one player per hand. I, I would say enforce it every single time. Um, uh, and then Tony says, splash the pot. You had to bring that ace. Don't put a heart up there. Correct. Yeah, all that stuff is too much. I mean, it is. Um, the thing that I say, I say it sort of casually. It's, it's, there's three players in the hand. We can't have a conversation like this. And if they object or anything like that, I'm, I, I, I've actually said in a relaxed room before, like, I'm enforcing this as passively as I can. But, like, you know, I can get in trouble if I don't say anything. Um, uh, Gibran says, uh, I hope I pronounced that right. Do you like the chips of the casino you are working right now? Um, they're okay. Uh, the chips at Texas Card House for about a year were pretty nice. Now they're a little bit sticky. Um, it's it's an endless challenge in casinos uh, dealing with stuff like this. Um, there's also the dynamic. I talked I talked about this when we were talking about the poker tables at Texas Card House before. To my knowledge, which I am not guaranteeing is accurate. To my knowledge, I believe that it is challenging for rooms in Texas to find vendors to sell chips to them. So like GPI, who is who I personally, if I was running a room, would buy chips from. They are uh, Gaming Partners International. They have the Paulson-ish chips and all that stuff that I personally really like. But it's very difficult to get a contract with them if you are not a uh, full casino and, and all this stuff. So, you know, compared to what's available in the market to the rooms in Texas, I think they did a pretty good job. Um, and... I feel sort of at peace with that, but they are a little bit sticky. I don't know what to do about that. Like if I'm running the room, uh, at some point I probably do something about it. I don't know what, I don't know if they just order new chips and cycle the old ones out or if they somehow clean them. I don't really know what the solution is to that. Um, but overall I think they're fine. I mean, they're nicer than the chips that I use in my videos. Uh, that's for sure. Um, Jacob says, is your spot with TCH temporary or do you plan on staying a while? Uh, impossible for me to say. So my relationship with Texas Card House completely goes through the GM who I am very close with. And I don't really have much, um, like I have permission to, to do what I'm doing here where I put their brand up on this. I am dealing there. I do enjoy it very much there. Um, but I don't really have much interaction with the owners, uh, a little bit here and there. And I have had positive interactions with them, but it's just not that it's not that much conversation for me to talk about this. Like, so for me, as an entrepreneur, I am at any given moment, if something comes up, I'm always going to pursue that. Um, but right now, I'm happy being at Texas Card House. And uh, I mean, there would have to be something that came up that pulled me out of it. And you never know, but I just I have no idea. Um, I, I will say that I, I don't expect myself to be at Texas Card House for 10 years. I, I, I can't imagine a scenario where I'm there. It's possible that I would come back after a while or something like that, if, you know, but it's hard for me to answer. Like I am, I am very day by day and trying to figure out what it is that makes sense for me to do all the time. Uh, thank you for that question. Thank you for all these questions. This is, this is great stuff to talk about. I appreciate you guys. Tony says, I've seen Lexo Poker's vlog at TCH. Those chips look really nice, um, but I feel like different chips than you used to are always more attractive. Um, yeah, the chips at Texas Card House, like I said, I mean, they, they certainly get the job done. And some of the bigger denomination chips, I sort of like, they had uh, $1,000 plaques originally. And then when they had some big games at Texas Card House, um, those big games sort of made it so there were too many thousand dollar plaques on the table and it was just way too much space it was taking up so then they ended up making slightly oversized 1k and 5k chips uh, which i think works really well there's literally only one time on a regular game i've seen a 5k chip in play um but yeah i think they're pretty good um and yeah, it's cool. Uh, Lexo Poker is another vlogger that does play at TCH. Um, I dealt to him the other day. He doesn't know who I am. And I'm not somebody that's like, hey, I'm true poker dealer. I just, I don't do stuff like that. It's, uh, I, I actually, I'm sort of curious whenever I'm dealing to somebody what they're really like. So I'm not trying to like say who I am and then get the, that version of who they are, you know? 
Um, I always think stuff like that's very interesting, personally. And a lot of the time, I don't know who knows me, um, which is a weird dynamic for me, but it's sort of fun. Like, I just have no idea. Um, and I find out in sort of funny ways. But let's see. Appreciate all those comments. Uh, Just send in a little text here. I've got, uh, I think I have a meeting a little bit after this. So I like keeping myself busy. I know it's a Sunday, but you know, what else did I have here? Um, one thing that's, that's really stood out to me uh, about dealing so many more hours than I'm used to is creating these little running jokes with players and, and all of this like, there's there's a camaraderie that I started to build up that I hadn't been building up when I wasn't there as much. And I, I mean, when I say you make more money when you build up this camaraderie, boy, is it true. And sometimes I have these weird dynamics with players where like they tip me extra because they like me because we have our running jokes. And then I think they wonder if they're genuine for me. And maybe like some of them don't know that I'm, I'm true poker. Deal. They don't know that I'm authentic. They don't know that I'm always having fun. I had somebody tell me, this past week, like, like, hey, you're giving me the fake laugh. And I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Um, and then later, I, I did a, a clear fake laugh to have fun with them because I thought it was funny to do because they did the whole response to it thing. And I just, I like stuff like that. Creating running jokes and dialogue with players is like really enjoyable. Um, it also makes it sort of weird to play though because, uh, when I'm a poker dealer, I'm very focused on the game that I'm dealing and there's a certain like expectation the players have of me when they see me outside of there. Um, I'm not as interested on in like I, like people love telling me about the hands that they're in and all this complicated stuff uh, poker wise. And I'm certainly there to sort of talk about it as I'm dealing as long as it doesn't affect the hand that's going on. but. When I'm not dealing, I'm not as interested in that stuff and people sort of talk to me about that stuff still. Um, although I will say this, there was a lot of conversation this week about Chris Moneymaker um, and how his run was in the main event. And I found that, that conversation to be really enjoyable. And also uh, Chance Cornuth, I think I pronounced that correctly. Um, I always think of him as Chance. I've, I've worked with his wife before. She's a really, really nice person. And he is currently, you know, up over five or so million in the World Series main event with 90 something players left. And, um, you know, he's an incredible poker player. And, and she is, like I said, she's a very, very good person. You know, I, I was a supervisor for Emily years ago in Florida. And this was right before she met him. And then while they were first together and then she ended up leaving, uh, she was a poker dealer at one point. And I'm definitely rooting for Chance right now. I've never met him personally, but knowing his wife, it's like cool to have somebody that, that I feel connection to that's actually in the main event still. Um, so, you know, shout out to Chance, uh, rooting for you in the main. Let me look at the chip count right now, because this is, let's see, main event chip count. I'm curious right now. I don't have any comments to respond to, so let's do this, see what it says. Where is everybody in the chip count? It says that Chance is at 5.9 million. He is in 21st place, and there are 96 players remaining. So I don't know if that's completely up to date, but um, I don't know what time they start playing again. But yeah, I've got someone I'm rooting for, just for the heck of it. Uh, Hit Girl says, I definitely talk too much and make too many jokes. It would be hard to ever try and deal in a legit room. <laughs> um, you know, there are some rooms that encourage that. And I always thought that that was not something a poker room would ever encourage. But, you know, some places they just they want to stand out in that way. And players come back when they get that that vibe. Um, and I mean, that's it's not a bad thing all the time. Uh, so I say what the hell like that's cool. And uh, but yeah, in a legit room, it might be pretty hard. 
And also, like, there's a lot of women that deal, and this is just what I've witnessed. I'm not saying it's good, bad, or anything else, but there's a lot of women that deal that have a incredibly flirty vibe going on. Everybody's got their own thing, and sometimes when I'm following a female dealer, I'm I'm like, like, damn, at the the dialogue that they've got going with the table. Um, I was following a dealer yesterday, and she was. Uh, she's pretty and she has this like vibe with the players that's that's got this like humor energy to it and she was i as i walked up she was saying like yeah i've been called a lot of things i forget what the names were one of the things she said she's called all the time is train wreck and she was like offering that as a nickname for the players to like work with and the players love stuff like that so i guess part of what i'm saying is if you do it properly and i don't know that she was doing it properly but if you do it properly you can even make it that can make its way into a to the dialogue as a dealer, even in a, in a legit card room. Uh, Jacob says, how often do you play? I used to play a lot more. Um, like, I've been playing poker since probably 2002 and playing in casinos since probably Chris Moneymaker, which is part of what made it cool to, like, see all that stuff um, with him in the main event. He did bust, if, if you guys didn't know that. Um when I for the five years that I was an entrepreneur, I probably played two five no limit cash games maybe five or six times a year. Um, and recently, I've probably played about eight sessions since March at Texas Card House. Only one two no limit um, short sessions compared to what I used to do. I, I when I would go play poker when I first started, I would play for hours. I used to do online poker advertising for affiliate marketing um, way back before the 2006 Unlawful Internet Gambling Act. Um, and I was like playing, I, I played probably 100,000 hands online and it was all money that I got as an affiliate marketer. Tony says, what happens when the action is folded to a player after post-flop, they have chips in their hand, do a forward motion with that hand? Oh, I'll, I'll answer this in a sec. So uh, just to finish it, nowadays I don't play as much because I've just, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, I got a lot going on, and poker's something I've been around for a long time, and when I deal a lot, I definitely prefer playing less, because I'm just there so much. Um, you know, a lot of poker dealers that I work with, though, they'll play and play and play, I'm sorry, they'll deal, they'll deal, they'll deal, and then they'll play after their shift, and I also don't like the feeling of losing, <laughs> it's just me, um, so, uh, you know, if I work... A shift and then I lose more than I made in that shift I'm gonna end up feeling bad about myself and so I, I sort of had this thing in my head about separating my own personal money if I if I create a poker bankroll for myself I'm much more likely to play a bit more but also I sort of have to have a goal um, nowadays I'd be much more likely to to strive to play tournaments and and try to build up a hen and mob or something like that for fun I could see myself enjoying doing something like that but Currently, uh, not playing a whole lot. Like I said, maybe eight sessions since March and much less recently. Although I've had some stuff happen in my life recently that's, you know, pulled me out of that. Um, okay, so, so back to this question. Tony says, what happens when action is folded to a player after post-flop? They have chips in their hand. Okay, folded to a player after post-flop. Okay. They have chips in their hand. Do a forward motion with that hand well beyond working space. I like that you're using that terminology. Uh, to anyone that doesn't know, working space is used in rooms often where there's no betting line that's enforced. So the area where you typically cut out your chips is considered your working space. And when you go beyond your working space into the area where you typically bet, um, then you're essentially in your betting zone. So the, the player does a forward motion with that hand well beyond their working space quickly brings their hand back without dropping chips and then declares check. Is this a min bet? So that's a really good question. Um, first, this the, the poker room itself is going to be the only one who can answer this officially. So there is not a universal answer to this question. Um, partly because what, what happens sometimes is you have cultures that develop within different regions where poker players get used to something and the room has to decide whether they want to booby trap them or not. Um, 
on a technical level, the thing that you described, if the room is using a working space rule and a player brings chips out, is supposed to result in some money being in the pot. Now, you said uh, the action is folded to a player after post-flop. So that, to me, means that somebody made a bet post-flop and it went fold-fold. Well, actually, hold on. I assume you mean checked to a player after post-flop because you said that this player checked. If it's folded to them, uh, they're not going to be able to check. So let's 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 guess that the thing that you meant is check, check, and it's this player's turn. They take chips, they come out here, and then they bring them back and check. That is supposed to be a minimum bet, and a minimum bet is not just like if it's a one two no limit game, the minimum bet is $2, but if they didn't have any white chips in their hand, then the minimum bet would be the um, smallest denomination chip that they had. So technically that would be if they had like a stack of $5 chips and they come out like that, then that would be a $5 bet. Um, if there's a bet that they're faced with and they do something like that and they bring it back and try to fold, that should be a call. But it's one of those things where you're supposed to enforce it as a dealer, but not hardcore. Like you enforce it, if they resist, you get a floor to actually assess the situation. Because ultimately this is sort of a floor call um, if there's resistance. As a reminder, one of the things that I teach, and it's really important to be a poker dealer and understand this concept, yes, you are there enforcing the rules, but no, you are not arguing with players or debating them or anything like that. If it gets to that point, you get a floor over. They're the ones that are supposed to do that. Even if, you're, even if you know that it's part of your job to enforce the rule, once there's resistance, it's not your job anymore. Your job is now to call a supervisor over. Um, so, uh, yeah, if a player comes well past their working space with chips, um, that is supposed to be a bet. At Texas Card House, there's a gray area that I sort of allow. And it's one of those things, too, where, like, what's the culture of the room? What do they do? You know, do you want to give the player a warning or do you want to actually enforce it? Um, and it totally depends on where you work and who you are and how you are and all this stuff. There's a lot to it. But technically, that is absolutely supposed to be a minimum bet, minimum being the smallest denomination chip that they are holding that they came out with. Uh, Jacob says, um, I don't plan on dealing knights. I know exactly what you mean. Um, gotcha. Um, I don't plan on, I don't, oh, I don't, wait, I don't play on dealing, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't play on dealing knights. Play, not plan. I don't play on dealing knights. I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, that, that, that feeling of, like, losing your money is a weird feeling. Um, BB with the, the $5 super chat. Appreciate that. Thank you. Another great and informative stream. Thanks, Mark. Uh, you're welcome, and, and thank you for that altogether. Definitely appreciate that. Um, you know, I said it before. I'll say it again. Getting tipped as a poker dealer is something I've gotten used to. It feels great every single time, but there's a familiarity with it. Every time that I get a super chat here, there's an unfamiliar feeling because it doesn't happen that much, and it, it feels really cool, so thank you. Uh, you know, I had an interesting conversation um, with a poker dealer. So a poker dealer was playing at my table about three weeks ago, and they scooped somebody in a bomb pot in a 2-5 game for about, I think it was a $4,500 pot, and they threw me two green chips. And I had a fun little side conversation with them after the fact about the proper way to thank somebody for uh, a tip like that. And their answer was sort of the same as what I thought. Like, you thank them the same as normal. You don't want to take those two green chips and make a big show of it, like, thank you, da 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 da, -da or anything like that. You just give them, like, a sincere thank you. And for me, I try to find the place in myself that's the genuine, real place to thank somebody. Um, so it's not like, thank you. It's like, thank you. Like, seriously. And then afterwards, I like to, and, and this person likes the same thing, we both like to do that special like eye contact thing that's not making a big show of it, where there's like that real like serious like thank you, because it makes an impact, right? Getting getting something like this definitely makes an impact. You're, in this case right now, BB and Hit Girl, you guys are affecting my channel in a way that is much more rewarding for me, and it's really cool, and I mean, the same thing when you get green chips later when you're tipping out and you see those green chips it makes a difference in your day like it just really does and i i, I mean i'm very appreciative 
Luke says, do you keep your tips or are they split evenly? We have our split. Most poker rooms nowadays, uh, in the U.S. anyway, do allow dealers to keep their tips. There is a, a small tip out percentage at Texas Card House, which helps ensure that the supervisors there are higher quality. And I am in hugely in favor of it because I've been a supervisor for a long time and it is much better to have uh, the highest quality supervisors you can. But most of the money is keep your own at Texas Card House. Um, and I have found that there are, a, there are still some rooms that do share tips nowadays. It's not nearly as many as it used to be. And um, I just, I personally believe that the, the quality of dealer in rooms where you split the tips is always going to be lower because the incentive to work harder, faster, all that stuff to make more money isn't really there. Um, yeah, I, I, I did notice sometimes as a player, you can tell when a room splits the tips, like maybe the tip boxes don't come with the dealer table to table and you're like, oh, they're splitting tips or, or they're doing something like that. Uh, there was a, a room I went to in New Hampshire that was like that. And I, I sort of felt bad for the dealers. Um, uh, Luke, uh, if you're if you're making good tips, splitting tips, that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, if you're not, consider going somewhere else. You can make you can make even better money. Super curious about that. So let's see what else we got here. Um, oh, I'll I'll change the subject for a second since I've got I've talked about everything I want to talk about. I am gonna wind it down pretty soon. Um, probably 15 more minutes on here. But recently I got into mining crypto, and there's a lot of overlap between the poker world and the crypto world, and. Um, I just sort of felt like mentioning that this is something I've been doing because it's fun, it's interesting, I'm learning a lot, and uh, just, I don't know, I felt like shouting out there that I've, I've started mining crypto, and I feel good about it, and I mean, you know, part of what I'm trying to do is create passive income and experiment with different things, and it's just, it's a fun thing to mention, so I just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, Luke says, we get around 300 a month from shared tips. It sort of changes the feeling of getting a tip, but I did receive a large tip last week, but I was very thankful. Oh yeah, I should mention Luke. I did work in a room that shared tips when I first started in the industry. So I was in Washington State at a casino where there was only a three table poker room. They had table games too. And the, the there were not poker dealers and table games dealers. It was all one big pool. Um, and because of that, like, I was just used to the feeling of sharing tips with table games. It was the very first room that I worked in. The tip rate was definitely lower as a result of that. It sounds like you're probably uh, outside the U.S. And, and that is a common thing there. And yeah, it does change the feeling of getting a tip. I mean, there's no question about it. I dealt a bad beat jackpot in a room where I shared tips. They gave me like $500 out of the $10,000. And I didn't get to see any of that. And I would hear stories about dealers that would receive money in the parking lot from players and stuff like that who really wanted them to receive the money. And, you know, if you get caught, you get fired. So to me, it was never worth it. Um, I definitely got offered stuff like that before. And I always said, like, I can't. Thank you, though. But uh, it's 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 definitely an interesting feeling. That being said, it's still it's still like sharing tips is better than not receiving tips at all. So I sort of have that view on it, and the tip rate was never terrible, terrible. Um, I, I am curious, now you said 300 a month, I'm curious, uh, and it was shared tips, 300 a month, I'm curious what country you're in, it doesn't sound like the US to me. Um, it sounds like you're probably in the UK or somewhere like that. Um, sorry for just throwing out one random country, I'm not trying to like be that way and make a judgment but i've heard a similar thing from someone in in the uk which is why i mentioned that david says supervisor supervisor quality sing it you've talked about being a dealer being a supervisor being a shift manager now that you want to make some money you're back in the box um very disappointed how many houses want good people to take a severe pay cut to take responsibility for running the room well so absolutely agree with you on that um for me personally, my motivation to deal is different though. At, at Texas Card House, you actually make good money as a supervisor. Uh, because there's so many tables going and they run it sort of thin, but they still run it well. And the, um, the supervisors there, I mean, they're good. 
they're choosing to supervise a lot of the time. The reason I'm in the box is not just because of the money. When I supervise, which I've supervised and shift managed most of my career in casinos, once I start doing that, like I care about everything and it just consumes me. And this is the first time that I've actually worked in a poker room after becoming an entrepreneur when I've got all this other stuff going on. Well, I can't, I can't be the supervisor that I am while I'm also uh, being an entrepreneur because I will care too much and I mean, it's just it's it's going to be a conflict for me if I were to do something like that. Supervising is almost always full time, by the way. So for me, it doesn't make sense for me to do that. Also, I'm true poker dealer. It had been five years since I dealt poker. I had to get my my uh, feet wet or hands dirty again. And it just made sense. And also, it's much more easy for me to be flexible as a poker dealer than it is for me to be flexible as a supervisor. But I'm going to be honest with you. I like flooring better. Why do I like flooring better? Number one, I'm not stuck at a table for 30 minutes ever. Dallas is sort of an exception. The players are really nice there. And so you don't run into this problem that much in Dallas. But sometimes you're stuck at a table with a bunch of people who are not nice people. And it's brutal. And like, it just is what it is sometimes. Being a poker dealer, you have no choice who you're dealing to. You get sent to a table and it is who it is. There's there's almost always players in every poker room that you're just like, oh boy, here we go. In Dallas, I have experienced an incredibly small amount of that. And it's really, really nice being in Texas Card House, Dallas. Like, I really mean that. That being said, like, I just, I really like supervising. There's more learning that you get the benefit of. There's interesting situations that come up. Uh, I really like running the rotation of a room and making sure that the people that, that work in the room are happy all the time. And, um... So, I mean, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, but to like, to like, I don't know if you're trying to do this or not. Now that you want to make some money, you're back in the box. Like, I'd be making a lot of money as a supervisor if I were doing that in, in Texas Cardhouse, Dallas, but I just, I can't make myself do it. I'll care too much is really the problem. Um, it says that I have a quality issue right now. I'm not sure exactly what's going on with that. What is happening here? Can you guys still hear me? Um, Patrick M says, you got your own mining rig, join shared mining pool. Um, I have uh, I have a partner who has set me up with, um, so now it says no data. This stream will end shortly unless you restart it in your streaming software. Okay, now it says excellent condition. I don't understand what just happened. My internet, I'm paying a lot of money for this internet and I'm sort of bummed out that, that this is what's happening. I'll have to talk to them about that. I don't understand, but, um, so you, you, Patrick said you got your own mining rig or you joined the shared mining pool. Uh, I've been using nice hash. I don't know what the answer to your question is based on that. I'm still learning this stuff. I also uh, bought a helium miner that hasn't showed up yet and I'm trying to figure it out. Um, but I have a machine that, um, is doing pretty well. I have two machines that I'm using right now and learning. Um, and I think when you say shared mining pool, you're asking me if it's using something like, like nice hash is what I'm using, which has been pretty cool to, to learn through. I think that's a shared mining pool where they just give you your share of the work because of the way that mining actually goes. But the amount of money per day has been pretty cool. Um, the electricity cost, I, I still have yet to see my first electricity bill with this built into it, but I don't think it's gonna be that bad. And I mean, this 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 whole learning experience is great. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy about it. Hit Girl says, I deal 10 to 12 hours at the same table with maybe one 10 minute break, but again, underground, it's me and one floor to get chips. I love it though. That is a great perspective of what it's like to deal a private game. I am very aware that that's how it goes. And man, is that a lot, you know, uh, 10 to 12 hours at the same table with one 10 minute break is absolutely crazy. When I say crazy, it's doable for sure. And, you know, you're sort of the face of poker for them there. So there's, there's a, a very strong, there's a very strong dynamic of, so I've done a version of this. I've never done this in an underground game or room. I've done a version of this in a poker room before. And like, 
now that I'm picturing you joking like you said you do and all this stuff, like players are probably coming there to be around you sometimes, which is really cool. It really creates a vibe and, and energy and all that stuff for people choosing to play in your underground game. Um, but that is hard to do. 10 to 12 hours at the same table with one 10 minute break is hard to do. Hopefully you're not doing this too many days a week, um, but you must do really well. Like I'm just picturing you must be making great money. So uh, it's really cool to hear and it's, it's just a different thing when you're in an underground game. There's no other way to say it. Uh, all right, so I am going to give you guys a chance for some last questions and comments. Um, I do have something at 2 o'clock that i got to jump off for, so uh, 2 o'clock Central Time, which is where I'm at. Um, appreciate you guys so much. Thank you all for the questions, the comments. Again, last, last chance for some comments before we wrap up the stream, and I say thank you to everybody. And... I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be doing this on Sunday. Appreciate everybody that's here, you know, hanging out with me. And Luke says, Mark, yeah, I do work outside of the U.S. The U.K. dealer, not a lot of variety in terms of places to work. All right, so that was familiar with what I heard. Maybe it was you that told me the 300 a month um, bonus as well, uh, which you said $300 in the U.K. It, it's got to be pounds, though, right? Um, it's a very, very basic question, but... Uh, does it does it feel like you're making decent money as a poker dealer in the UK? I'm actually really curious about that. Like, what um, what's it like receiving poker dealer money in the UK? Um, if you don't mind answering that, and then I'll I'll say goodbye to everybody. Stick around for a sec. Ooh, let me answer a text while I'm waiting for Luke's response. Um. Oh yeah, I just did a mental conversion. That makes sense. Cool. Wow. So you're 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 on my stream here in the chat, like converting pounds to dollars. That's awesome. It makes me happy. Um, let's see. Well, I do want to say thank you to everybody. Um, I'll give Luke another minute or so to respond, and thank you everybody for watching the stream and for the super chats and. Uh, let me see. Today is the 14th, so I will see you guys again this coming Sunday. Um, and oh, good question. Hit Girl says, uh, at Luke, how many hours a month do you work? That's a great question, and I'm going to stick around for a second and allow that answer to come through if Luke is able to give us that. Um, and I am going to follow up here. Uh, I do four eight-hour shifts a week. I'm 20 years old and earn roughly 15 an hour plus tips. Money is good for my age. Okay, so that that that's uh, he did another conversion here. So $15 an hour plus tips. So you get a little bonus tips each month, and that's not too bad. 32 hours a week. Um, Corbin says, "Thanks again, Mark. I rewind and listen to your response for me. Uh, you're welcome. Appreciate all the comments. Appreciate you guys." All right, I'm going to say good, goodbye for now. See you guys next Sunday. Um, definitely a, a good stream. Really, You guys really brought the questions today. Awesome.